Good evening. Welcome to the Salem Area Mass Transit District uh, virtual or excuse me hybrid board meeting um, for Thursday, February 24th, 2020. We're here um, partially uh, both remote and then also at Courthouse Square in downtown Salem. Uh, we begin today's meeting and I'll make a note of the attendance. We have uh, two members of the board excused from today's meeting, uh, Director Enohost Pressey and Director Carney, and then Director Richards is absent this evening. Um, I'll go ahead and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'll ask General Manager Pollock to lead us in the safety moment. Great, thank you. So tonight uh, I'd like to focus my comments on workplace safety tips that every employee should know. And since so many people now work from home, uh, these really can apply to your home as well, especially your home workspace. Uh, so the first is to declutter your workspace. Uh, clutter will not only hinder your ability to work efficiently, but it also poses a serious threat to your safety. The inability to perform a swift action at the spur of a moment uh, due to an unorganized workstation can prove life-threatening, not only for you, but for others around you. Uh, another tip is to create an ergonomic workplace. And ergonomics is not just choosing the right type of office furniture, but it's also about organizing your workplace to suit your body and mind. Know your emergency exit ways to exit uh, in case of an emergency. Identify and familiarize, familiarize yourself with hazard zones of your workplace and take prompt action if you find something amiss in those high-risk zones. Uh, do a daily toolbox safety talk or safety moments uh, at uh, regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, have uh, your protective gear uh, close by to you, especially in this era of PPE. Always having your mask uh, available in case uh, people come to visit you or you need to exit your workspace. And uh, lastly, uh, make sure you take uh, adequate break intervals. Uh, getting enough rest and recreation ensures you're alert to the task you are doing. Getting sufficient rest and taking adequate breaks to return to your task, fresh and energetic, will help reduce the risk of injury. That concludes my safety moment. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll proceed to public comment. Uh, I will note for the record that we have not received any written public comment in advance of the meeting, and there are no members of the public present to provide public comment this evening. So we'll proceed to the consent calendar. So if there's no issues with the items on the consent calendar, uh, would someone please make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Okay, we have a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. We have a second. All those in favor, say aye. Or, sorry, any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, uh, thank you. Now we'll proceed to the action items on our agenda. The first is, uh, well, I'll let General Manager Pollock introduce Great. it. Great. Uh, tonight, uh, Greg Thompson will uh, present the staff report. Uh, uh, as it relates to a contract for uh, bus depot chargers. Greg? Uh, thank you, General Manager Pollock. Uh, Director Davison, uh, members of the board, good evening. Tonight, I'm asking the board to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Gillick LLC for the purchase of fixed route electric bus chargers and equipment for the Del Webb maintenance yard for an amount not to exceed $1,090,428. Through a competitive grant application process, Chariots was awarded two consecutive low no grants, one in 2020 and again in 2021. Each individual grant award provided for five electric buses, charging infrastructure and project management costs. All 10 buses will be charged overnight via plug-in dispensers at the Del Webb maintenance facility. The Chariot staff has been working closely with their project consulting firm CTE, the Center for Transit and the Environment, and bus manufacturer Gillig to ensure the best equipment is used for charging that is tailored to meet the unique demands of the chariot service. Project de product demonstrations and interviews were conducted 
with several charger manu manufacturers. <clears throat> Staff educated themselves in charger nomenclature, charger operations, charger capacity, and prior to narrowing down the vendor of choice. During this process, ChargePoint quickly surfaced as the vendor of choice because of their charging model, support, charge times, and hardware experience. So for this project, project there will be a total of six power blocks to charge 10 buses at the Delaware facility. Uh, the power blocks are components that control the charging dispensers. So each, each power block will control two dispensers. So in total, there'll be 12 dispensers, which create charging security th through redundancy. And I, I do have a, a few images of what that charger would look like. I'll share my screen here. Can everyone see the, the orange charger on their screen? Yes. All right, so this is a, a typical, uh, what the charge point charge express plus charger looks like. Ours will actually be slightly different. I couldn't find an image of that. And it'll only have one, one cord on one side, but it'll still have the same cable management, uh, just, just like this uh, animated uh, is, is showing now. And we'll, we'll charge our buses, not trucks. But the, the idea is the same. They look identical. So those 12 uh, dis dispensers are powered by uh, this unit here, which is about the size of a small refrigerator, uh, which is a power block. So two, one power block for two dispensers. And I will stop sharing. Um, included included in the overall cost uh, of this project, of this, this ask for tonight, includes a five-year warranty for each dispenser and each power block. Uh, charge point also includes cost to provide chariots with site-specific drawings for all infrastructure and any project and any project management support with a dedicated project manager on, on their side, as well as cost for commis commissioning the chargers when the buses arrive. This will ensure all components are functioning properly as designed. The software cost included with this project is, is the use of ChargePoint's operating network. Uh, this will allow Chariots to monitor electrical consumption, charging priorities, and manage electrical costs. The pricing from Gilead comes directly from the Washington State Price Agreement. The funding for this proposed contract will be included in the capital projects budget of SAMPD's adopted fiscal year 22-23 budget. An itemization of cost is outlined in table one below. I'll, I'll go over uh, each of those costs. So we have a total of six power blocks uh, of $87,300 each for a total of $523,800. We have the 12 200 amp dispensers, uh, $13,900 each for a total of $166,800. The warranty for the power blocks is a total of $185,700. The warranty for the dispensers for the, the five years is a total of $82,200. Uh, the services that I, I spoke about earlier the charge point site site design is a, a singular cost of five thousand dollars. The uh, charge point project support is a singular cost of thirty-one thousand six hundred dollars. The, the commissioning is a one a singular cost of seventeen thousand four hundred dollars. And then access to their the the service plan uh, to, to monitor and look at our how our charging is operating is $4,799 uh, per charger for a total of 12, so a total of $57,588. And then there is uh, a total shipping and freight for all of these units and equipment of $20,340 for a total of $1,090,000, $1,090,400. Funding for the proposed contract is covered through the, the fiscal year 20 low no grant and the fiscal year 21 low no grant. Both of those grants have, have different mount, match amounts. Um, 
the total the total the total cost is broken out evenly over each of those grants, but with the different match amounts, the dollar amounts are, are different. So for the fiscal year 20 low note grant, it's a 75, 25% uh, match. The, the grant amount is $278,060. And our match amount is $267,154. So that's $545,214. Again, you see the, you know, the same total in the, for the fiscal year 21 grant, different match amounts of so the 85, 15, so the grant amount for the 21, fiscal year 21 grant is $463,432. And the match amount is 81,782 for a total project of $1,090,428. Staff recommends that the board authorized, authorized the general manager to execute a contract with Gillig for the purchase of fixed route electric bus depot chargers and equipment for the Del Webb maintenance yard for an amount not to exceed $1,090,000, $90,428. It's a big number. <laughs> and uh, are there any questions? Any questions? Director Navarro. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So one question that I have is, um, what's the charge time on, uh, for one of these, uh, for one of the buses? Thank you, Director Navarro. That, that, that was actually one of our uh, criteria that we we're looking at. So one of our considerations are, you know, when we do our modeling for what we're expecting the battery state of charge to be when the bus comes back to the yard, helps determine the overall charge time. Uh, right now with our calculations, we're expecting uh, about three and a half hours for that bus to come in, come in off of its service and uh, be fully charged and ready for the next day of service. Uh, so, so right now, uh, that, that gives us lots of time. We have more more than that time uh, that the bus is actually, uh, you know, from the time it comes off the road to the time it goes out is longer than three and a half hours. So we've got some a little bit of safety there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to confirm that this is a DC charger, not a level two. It is a DC charger. The the uh, that power block takes the uh, uh, AC current uh, and it's converted at the dispenser into the, the DC. Great, yeah. So that's the the fastest charger on the market. It's stupidly fast. It is. It, to put it, and I had to check that my uh, facilities person as an electrician to put this in, into the scale. Most modern homes, their service panel coming into their home is 200 amp. So this is a modern home, <laughs> electrical service. So I mean, it's it's uh, pretty powerful. Director Wynn. Great, thank you, President Davidson. I am really pleased that we ended up landing on ChargePoint. In my previous life, when I've had to uh, shop for hardware, we also landed with um, ChargePoint and their warranty is just very um, top, top the line. And also I'm really looking forward to uh, what uh, our operations folks can uh, utilize on their back end because the software and the tech, uh, the information that you can get from their back end is also very robust. So. Uh, great work on the procurement team. Thank you. Um, one other question. So with our Dell Web facility, um, did we have to pay for any upgrades with Salem Electric to be able to stick these power blocks and these chargers? And if so, is that a secondary cost? Uh, great question, uh, Director Davidson. That's that is another piece of it. So there's a couple moving couple moving pieces in this whole thing. One is our partnership with Salem Electric. Uh, you know, there's a we're going to include a line extension, the addition of a, uh, a larger transformer, a 2.5 megawatt transformer. Uh, it's going to be quite big. We're trying to do what we can to future proof. Uh, you know, future expansion, more electric buses, so we don't have to you know reduplicate our efforts. Uh, including, you know, when we're uh, laying conduit, laying extra conduit, you know, dig, dig once. Uh, but there are several, several pieces that will, uh, costs that we'll still incur. Some will be some incremental costs for Salem Electric. Uh, 
and, and how far they go. There'll be some cost from the construction side of it. Uh, and there will also be some uh, additional, you know, there's, there's still, we still have to take care of metering and switch gear, transfer boxes, and some of those things. Uh, so there's, they'll, you'll probably see me again. <laughs> but th this will take care of the chargers themselves and, and get us kind of tabled in that uh, uh, line, put us, in, put us in line with, you know, uh, making sure that these products will arrive before our, our deadline that we've imposed. Great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, uh, would someone like to make a motion? Please. I move that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Gilling LLC for the purchase of fixed route electric bus depot chargers and equipment for the Del Webb maintenance yard for an amount not to exceed $1,090,428. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Next action item. Great, so now I'll ask Steve Dickey, uh, our Director of Technology and Program Management to come on the screen and present the report. Good evening, President Davidson, members of the board. Uh, tonight, we are coming before the board to ask, shall the board authorize the general manager to execute a five-year contract with Delarock Incorporated, a fully owned subsidiary of Cubic Transportation Systems Incorporated for the purchase of their contactless fare payment system for the use across Chariot's local and regional services and approve an overall project budget of $784,003. Currently, Salem Mary Mass Transit District uh, utilizes cash payments and a magnetic uh, stripe card that is used for payment of our, our fares on our local fixed route services. And then we use what are in our industry known as a flash pass on our regional service and our, our partner with uh, SMART. Those passes are uh, simply a card that is printed that is held up with the correct information for the time period being used. Uh, customers are able to purchase single day passes, monthly passes, and other reduced fare passes at the customer service department, at uh, the downtown transit center, and also uh, they can purchase day passes on the bus at this time. Uh, we also partner with uh, some select retailers in the community to be able to sell our 30 day passes and day passes, um, or only our 30 day passes. And then we also have social service agencies uh, purchase bulk amounts of the passes to distribute to their clients or sign up for employer bus, bus pass programs. However, there are some limitations to these um, methods that we use for uh, fare payment. And this solution that we are proposing will address several of those issues. The contactless fare payment project seeks to simplify fare collection by implementing an electronic account-based contactless fare payment system the fare payment system will aid Salem Mary Mass Transit District in reducing the burden of validating fares uh, by incurred by operators and the complexity of managing many different fare instruments. Uh, customers will benefit through increased payment options, which include fare capping, convenience of pass management, and facil facilitated boarding experience. Some of the things that this will do for our passengers is uh, be able to use either a uh, smart card that they can purchase at our customer service department or through our retail outlets, or they can actually download an application onto their smartphone and utilize that. The system uses uh, near field technology where the, the phone or the card does not even actually have to touch the reader. Uh, it also has the capability of producing uh, paper one day tickets that could be sold at customer service with a QR code that can be read by the reader as well. The other exciting uh, advantage of this approach is the ability to implement fare capping. Now let me explain fare capping a little bit. Fare capping is a more equitable manner of approaching our passes. Currently, if you purchase a day pass or a, 
or a 30 day pass, you get a price break for any trips that you take beyond what um, would be the equivalent of slightly over two one way trips on a day pass or over um, the period of time uh, that you would spend on day passes that it would cost to accumulate for a 30 day pass. How fare capping works is you board the bus, you use your fare implement, either your smart card or your smartphone, you tap and you ride. Once you've hit the amount, it would cost you for a day pass in that 24 hour or in that day period between the beginning and ending of our service day. It caps at the amount that you would have paid for a day pass and it continue, you can ride as many times as you would like for the rest of the day without being charged any additional fare. Once you hit the amount of a monthly pass within a 30 day period, the same thing happens. The fare is capped and then you don't pay any more for any more trips you take within that 30 day period. This provides an opportunity for people who are in lower income brackets where it may be difficult for them to make a decision to purchase a monthly pass at the beginning of the month, not knowing for sure if it would be financially beneficial to them because they don't know if they would take enough trips or not to, to make that worth their while. This allows them to pay for that same advantage one trip at a time without the risk of, of having overspent if they don't need to. This also gives people a greater flexibility in managing their, their fair account. This is a contact or account-based contactless fair payment system that has an online account that allows them to load either through an online portal, through the web or their app on their phone, or by uh, simply going to customer service or one of the retail outlets that would allow for recharging of their account. And in those locations, they could pay with cash or uh, any other form of payment allowed by the, the location. One of the other advantages of this system is it also will allow customers to use uh, credit cards for open payment. Sometimes when you have a system like this, uh, people who come to visit an area don't necessarily want to buy a, a, a smart card or download an app just specifically for that area. They would like to be able to just pay as they for the times that they are there and they would just use a credit card. Now, there is a higher fee associated with that, and we certainly for regular users would strongly encourage them to use the app or the smart card because of lower cost to the district. But it is a convenience that we feel is important and a greater deal of flexibility for, for the customers. Um, this also, the system, while it is not a system that is um, designed like a ORCA card in the Puget Sound area where you have multiple agencies all signed on, because it is an account-based system with this company, if you go to another location, which in Oregon right now, uh, the MX system in Eugene with Lane Transit District, uh, Rogue Valley Transportation District in Medford and Central uh, or Cascades East Transit in Bend, all are using this system and you would be able to pay for your fares at, that loca at those locations as well with the same system. And any other agency that came on board and chose to use the same system would be also be able to have that same flexibility. On August 4th of, of 2021, the district issued a request for proposals for this system and the solicitation closed on September 22nd. There were seven proposals submitted and five were determined to be initially responsive to the solicitation requirements. The Source Evaluation Committee was formed to review and evaluate all proposals and after initial review determined that only four met all requirements in the RFP. After further review, the SEC requested clarification questions in response to the proposals and performed an intermediate scoring. Subsequently, there were two suppliers determined to be finalists. The proposals were evaluated across four categories and the Source Evaluation Committee committee evaluated, interviewed, and conducted a final scoring. The decision of the SEC was to recommend a contract award to the highest scoring supplier, which is Del Rock Incorporated, a fully owned subsidiary of Cubic Transportation Systems. The stated completion time for this project is about 30 weeks from the contract execution. Um, there is a uh, a description here of the financial impact. One of the things that we are asking for is a five-year approval for the project budget 
of $784,003. This is over five years. The year one startup cost, which is for all the capital equipment, software installation and training, and the first year licensing fees uh, and the fair media supplies, plus a contingency of 15% is $431,695. And this amount was approved in the uh, current fiscal year budget. For years uh, two, three, four, and five of the contract, the fees and maintenance are listed in the uh, board memo of 83,712 for year two, 86,520 for year three, 89,484 for year three, and 92,592 for year four. These will, the subsequent years will be included in the budget for the general services for years 2023, fiscal years 2023 through 26. We have a breakdown in table one of the table uh, startup in year one costs in table one. And then in table two, we have the identification of the sources of funding, which are a, two, a fiscal year 2018 flex 5307 fund with surface transportation block grant and a fiscal year 2019 5307 uh, grant as well for $431,695. Staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to execute a five-year contract with Delarock Incorporated, a fully owned subsidiary of Cubic Transportation Systems Incorporated for the purchase of their contactless fare payment system for use across Cherry's local and regional services and approve all overall project an overall project budget of $784,003. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Staff Director Dickey. Any questions? Director Wynn. Thank you, President Davidson. Not so much a question as it is a statement of excitement to have seen this develop since I was on the budget uh, committee. And um, just as Director Dickey had said, this is incredibly uh, equity focused to be able to fair cap. And it gets us strides ahead in achieving our goal to providing world-class service as um, my newer counterparts had uh, not joined the board yet, but I've previously mentioned when I've traveled internationally, they are able to use their transit cards to even pay for uh, convenience store items. And um, we want to make uh, public transit usage as user-friendly as possible. And this is one step toward the right direction. So uh, I will be happily um, casting my vote for this and, and thank you for all the work. Thanks, Director Wynn. Director Duncan. Uh, I'd like to echo the excitement. A large, I don't know if anybody knows, but a large portion of the reason I'm, I even came out for the board was an experience where I struggled to be able to get a pass when I first came to Salem. And that kind of started this whole situation. So I'm very, very happy to see this. Um, there is one piece I want to ask a question about, and I understand if that's not part of this project, but because we're talking about fair accessibility, I just want to find out if it, if it is related and I just didn't catch it. So one of the things that, that I think is a hole in our system is that you can't purchase a pass directly off the Chariot's website right now. And I'm really excited that the app will allow you to do that. But do we have a way that you could potentially like purchase online and have it mailed to your house? Because I know a lot of elderly individuals that probably won't use the app and may, if they don't have a pass already, may not be able to get to one of the locations. I was just wondering if there's a reason that you could, in, that you could because I probably just don't know. I was just hoping we could provide a little clarity or if that's just a different topic, that's fine too. I know in the past, and this is going back a few years past, we had done that, um, mailed uh, passes to people when they requested uh, through the mail. And frankly, since that, that division or that section has not has moved out of my division. I would defer that question to our uh, director Feeney, our director of communication, as customer service is part of hers, and she might be able to answer that question for you. Great. I'll I'll reach out and we'll. I, it's not it, it directly relevant, so I have no problem reaching out to her. But thank you very much. And again, I'm very excited for this. <laughs> Maybe to piggyback off of what. Director Duncan's question is, I'm, I'm wondering if with this change in fair payment system, if we might be able to see an expansion of retail locations that sell, if we're talking a card, a card.
President Davidson, members of the board, there there is certainly an opportunity. Um, depending on the the networks that are willing to work with us, I know that um, uh, in many of these types of situations, the the networks are tied more likely to some of the larger national chains because that is just something that they have the capability to to handle within their point of sale systems and. Um, it functions much the same as if you go to a retail establishment and purchase a, a gift card for any number of establishments where you can go up and say, I would like to put $50 on this card or $75 on this card. And they simply scan the card, load the dollar amount that you're paying for, and it's placed on that card. Uh, so it's much the same, same type of approach. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to be able to see a a system similar to Orca where you go to a Safeway and you're able to purchase a transit card. I imagine that TriMet's hop is, is somewhat similar in terms of expa expansive options of where you can purchase. Other questions, please. Thank you, uh, President Dav Davidson. So the question that I have is, um, does a rider have to tap again when they board again in the same day? I'm assuming yes, but and that's where the fare capping comes in. Am I correct? Uh, yes, uh, Director Navarro, yes. Uh, it is, uh, you will tap each time and that does help us also have data. There's no data that will be able to trace us to a particular individual, but it does give us counts and types of trips that were taken and also the locations. So those boardings will help us just with how many trips were taken and how many trips were taken per type of card. But that also helps us know the capping. And uh, so there is um, every time you board. So currently our, our day pass is $3.25. Um, a one-way fare is $1.60. So two trips is $3.20. As soon as you took that third trip, you would be over that $3.25. What this will do is on that third time you tap your card, it caps the total amount you would pay at $3.25. So you would only pay five cents more for that third trip. And if you took a fourth trip, fifth trip, it would not matter. It, it would just stay capped at that amount within that day. And then once you hit the, the price of our monthly pass in that 30 day period, the same thing happens caps and the rest of the trips for that 30 day period don't cost any more, but you do tap each time you board. And if I could follow up. Um, so how would the system know, would they be able to cap um, after a certain amount of days that would be the equivalent of purchasing like a monthly pass? Yes, that would be from a 30 day period, just the same as our 30 day cards now are activated based on the first time that you use it. That's when the 30 day time starts. So each of these accounts will have a unique digital ID. And once you tap, that'll be the first register period of your use. So the first time somebody uses this account, that'll start the clock ticking for your day. And then also your 30 day time click for the, the 30 day pass. So if within any 30 day period, you hit that, that cost and this, I believe it is a rolling 30 day period. It's not a static 30 day period. If within any 30 day period, you hit that, then it will count the rest of those 30 days and at the end of the 30 days, then it would start that again. Perfect. So you don't, you. Have to, you don't have to have a 30 day and then um, never quite get there. If you hit that period within a 30 day period, that amount, then the remainder of 30 days is, is no more than a, a 30 day pass. Perfect, thank you. Director Wynn. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, Director Dickey, I actually did have a question come to mind. I know that that probably is all of the upgrades that we're doing to our buses in order to accept these cards. I'm curious if Cubic Transportation Systems has built out so that way there's portability for us to be able to use this. I'm envisioning, you know, for like the guaranteed ride home program for the van pool, for example, and or um, being able to uh, utilize this for the travel options program as well. Is that is that portability an option or? We, we, we are only looking at the, the transit side first, the bus uh, side. Director Wen, we, we were looking primarily at the transit side first. 
Um, these types of accounts do have the capacity to have greater flexibility within what we would call uh, uh, becoming more of a mobility manager. Um, some of the details of that then how you actually activate that notification of payment collection happen differently depending on the, the mode and the type of service. Plus, um, in some smaller vehicles, it's it's very difficult because you have you have a reader that is of a certain size and just having a place to place that where you could easily use it. But there are other systems uh, in places where um, you can have it where you schedule your trip and then when the operator picks you up and says, uh, so if we're talking like a car share type of setting um, where they pick you up and then they registered that you were picked up, then it would charge your account. So those are the types of things that you can also do with these. So okay. there's that would be that would be the next step in this process. So it has the, the technology has the capability. We just didn't include that in this particular solicitation. Please. So how soon could they be implemented? <laughs> Thirty weeks. Is that right? The, 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 this current proposal, uh, Director Duncan, uh, the, their proposal stated that they, we would be operational within 30 weeks from the time we have a contract signed. Great, thank you. Director Dickey, um, you, I don't know if I'm getting the terminology correct, but I think you referred to this as a account-based system, is that right? Yes, that is okay. correct, President Davidson. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that Rogue Valley, Lane Transit, and I think Cascade East utilize this. Is there interoperability with the TriMets of the world that evidently you do not use an account-based system? Unfortunately, any system that is not operating with the Cubic Delaroc uh, system would not function with this system because it would be on a separate account. And one of the challenges, uh, we were presented with the opportunity to be part of TriMet system, but they opted to do a self-developed proprietary system, which would, when we looked at the cost, was um, significantly higher, significantly higher. We were uh, at least three to four times annually what we would be looking at in the first startup costs of this, this proposal. And also there were significant limitations in that, that we, any time that there would be a fair structure adjustment, it would have to be something that they would agree to and have to manage for us. And it was, it was something that when we looked at it from a business perspective, it just did not make sense. Uh, but there are other, other systems out there as well. And one of the challenges right now in this, this part of our industry is uh, as I said, there were seven proposals that we received. That would tell you that there are seven proposals or seven companies out there that are actively going after this business and that are functioning within different parts of the world that provide these services. I can tell you though, that uh, the Cubic Dollar Rock uh, service, uh, their system is probably one of the more widely utilized uh, in the industry, especially in North America. Uh, they have uh, a number of different properties that are, are have adopted it, and it is one of the um, the the companies out there that are really looking at this from a broader perspective as well. I have seen presentations um, from Cubic that really are focused around the whole mobility as a service, uh, becoming a mobility manager type of approach rather than just a transit payment uh, mechanism. And so that was also one of the things that uh, understanding that they are a, a company that has that broader perspective and a, and a greater depth felt that there would be a, lot, a higher likelihood of a broader uh, acceptance and uh, utilization of it. As we see uh, this part of our industry begin to kind of settle into what are the norms going to be. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, I'm... I'm loath to close the door for interoperability with our nearest transit neighbor, um, at least nearest large transit neighbor. Um, so that that is a reservation I have, but I do have other questions that I'll, I'll maybe ask uh, as I ponder this. Um, 
is would well actually first on in the table one uh, there's something referred to as fair media and supplies and we're buying a thousand units of them what is that those would be the smart cards those okay. would be the, the the actual smart cards themselves so based on uh the research that we did with other agencies of the percentage of the transactions that they saw of their initial based on what they originally would sell of passes the percentage that they saw in that first year that transitioned to this this new uh, technology is what we based our estimate of the number of those uh, cards that we would need understanding that the um, that the acceptance and choice of a smart card versus the, the app on the phone was also some of the information that we uh, received from some of the other uh, locations where this, this solution is in use. Great, thank you for that. Um, would, does the, this purchase price for the fair payment system, I imagine that includes the, the actual hardware that will go in the vehicles. And if so, are we looking at backdoor boarding as well? At this time, we are not, uh, but it does have the capability to do that. Yeah. We did not. Uh, we did not look at that because it's typically not our our um, approach. And currently, we have not seen that as being a high need in the future. If we start seeing those demands on particular routes, that would be something uh, simple enough to to add quantity. And the installation of it by by comparison to other things is relatively simple. Now I'm I'm not not diminishing the complexities of installing, but but by by comparison to uh, other types of systems on these buses, this type of a reader is fairly simple to install. Sure. Um, for the the example that Director Navarro gave, where you know multiple taps during a day. Is, is there a transfer window included like we have now? The system certainly has a capability of doing that. Uh, basically the fare structure and how and when it is charged is fully at our discretion because they will uh, take what we tell them it, we needed to do, whether you have zoned fares or you have you know, six fare categories or two fare categories, However, we tell them we needed to be structured is how the the back what we call the back end of how that card will be charged is structured. If we say we want to have transfers, we can have transfers, and that's just an internal business decision that uh, we would make. And then, of course, anytime we have a fair policy shift or change, um, that will require you know action by the board because that is something that is required. Great, thank you. And in fact, uh, that is that is an important detail that as we get closer to actual implementation of this, the the formalization of the use of this will will need to come to the board in the action of changing our fair ordinance. Okay, great, thank you. Um, how of the seven organizations that competed, how close was the runner-up in terms of the procurement scores? The, actually, the runner-up was very, very close. Um, they were, it actually came down to, and, and the scoring of this price is not the highest uh, number of points, and it did come down to price making the difference. Um, but the two scores were within, I would have to look up the scoring sheet unless uh, Mr. Knaus has those, uh, those right at his hand, but um, they were within, I believe, four or five points. Out of a out of a total of one hundred. Okay. And if I understood you correctly, the to be interoperable with TriMet, CTRAN, and Streetcar, we would have to buy into their system. And I imagine they did not bid. They were not one of the seven bidders. That is correct, President Davidson. They they did not bid, and their system is completely proprietary. It is not interoperable with any other system. Okay. Thank you, Director Wynn. I can wait if uh, Manager Knauss had. Oh yes, please. Did you have sorry about that? Yeah, no, sorry about that. Uh, I was taking time for my mouse to get over there. 
uh, um, President Davidson and directors of the board, the fair sc the scoring on the solicitation was uh, 88.1 as a score for the uh, cubic transfer transportation systems and for the uh, runner up it was 86.6. So it was a very close solicitation, very competitive. Was, was the runner-up also an account-based system? President Davidson, members of the board, yes, yes. Uh, the, the structure of all seven actually were account-based systems. Uh, they, they did structure their back end a little differently in how they handled their and managed the accounts, but they are all, all account-based. Director Wynn. Great, thank you so much. Um, if I can uh, appease or calm your fears about interoperability, I had to actually look to see, but our neighbors to the north, um, Vancouver, BC, uh, TransLink is actually, I've had personal usage and they are uh, on the back end, uh, Cubic um, Del Delarock. I might be, in. Director Dickey. Uh, yes, yes, that is correct, Director okay. Roy. Yeah. And uh, so, so what I can say is, from a DEI perspective, I want to commend the selection committee because um, birds of a feather flock together and uh, they are in sync step as a company with our efforts for DEI and knowing and having seen firsthand um, the transformation that having their technology provide um, the Vancouver BC transit, um, I, I feel um, much more at ease uh, knowing that it does not communicate with uh, our neighbors to the north in Portland. Thank you for that. Do, do we know who, who the provider is for Orca? I know that's uh, an incredibly President, unfair question, but. Yeah, President Davidson, uh, no, actually I don't have that information at, at my fingertips. I, however, I do know that it was a very, very lengthy process for all of the jurisdictions to mm -hmm. work through the process to establish intergovernmental agreements between each of them because of how their accounts were handled. Um, it was a, a central system that then the allocation of the revenue was very, very, very complex. Um, I mean, we're talking months if not over a year for some of those jurisdictions to finally come to agreement on how they would receive what they perceived as their fair share of the the fair revenue and this simply is able to identify you boarded a chariot's bus you paid with your account that's where the revenue goes and if you were in a Medford, it would recognize that you were on an RBT bus and they would get the fair revenue for that trip. Right. I, I guess I'll maybe reiterate my concerns only for my own sake, um, is that given that this is a five-year contract and we're hoping to move in the direction of a mobility integrator, I, I, I am very pleased that we at least have the possibility of allowing for other modes within our own system. Um, I'm also keenly aware that pre-COVID, there were 60,000 people commuting from Salem to Portland every day. And if I am hopeful that the state or somebody else, perhaps another entity, will have more frequent service between the different cities within the Willamette Valley, and whether that's by bus or rail, and I would love to see some kind of integrated regional system. I fully recognize that we alone can't you know, snap our fingers and make that happen. Um, I, I, I guess I'm just, perhaps I, I have a question for Director Wynn. I, while applying an equity lens, I, 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 I recognize the strengths of the Cubit Del Rock, but I, I wonder if for those that utilize the public transit services, for those that use the two systems, chariots, and TriMet or Chariots and you know, whomever. Um, it, to, to me, it seems like allowing for as little friction as possible between those, those that navigate between two metro areas 
especially given you know increasing housing costs. Many people are being pushed out of the inner city and Salem is now functionally a bedroom community to Portland. Um, I don't know, I, that wasn't much of a question, but I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts and perhaps others on the board. And thanks for the opportunity to elaborate on, on my version of justice, equity and diversity and inclusion. What I was speaking to Cubics is the fact that for a company, they are uh, very in tune with the way that they go about investing in their, the, the care of their veterans. Their um, ESG programs and their DEI efforts are all very laudable and commendable. And so they are in sync step with us. Now to your question about choice writers that have the luxury of living, let's say, um, in Salem and uh, commuting to Portland and having to make that transfer uh, at SMART. Um, I would say those without choice would probably not uh, be subject to that kind of, uh, in, the, the concern is interoperability, right? You, you either have a digital divide where a low, lower SES or and maybe generational divide that prevents someone from being able to have access to apps. And now you're talking two apps, not just one, right? Um, I know that north of us, TriMet has had a heck of a time integrating just the hop, hop pass. I think uh, by going with Cubic, and it's widely accepted in a very large transit and very well received and embraced public transit system like that of Vancouver. I am hoping that potentially uh, they see the ways of uh, interoperability as a concern and then they make the change. Um, but but I, I feel very bullish about that. That's why I say uh, I'm, I am very thankful for the diligence that the selection committee has made in Factoring in all of the considerations, um, I, I, I don't have that reservation or the, it has not caused me pause. I, I feel like our neighbors to the north um, have that as potentially a growing edge for them, for themselves to consider. I've seen it be lackluster in the implementation of the hop, hop pass, for example. Okay, that is And helpful. that's from my previous hat serving community uh, in low SES and uh, the BIPOC community specifically. Yeah. Um, oh, please. Uh, so I used TriMet for a long time pre-hot pass, but what I will say is that I remember the, the conversations, at least from the transit community, when they were trying to make these decisions and mm, the reserve, there were reservations even from the community in doing a, in, at least I remember in the conversations that, that we had on the buses about the, the, the independent system. And I do think that if we are to, you know, join with Lane and Rogue and Cascade East, that kind of puts more in our court to convince, like as Director Wynn was saying, for them to come over to, to our version of things where it is, the system that they have chosen has made it very difficult for us to integrate. As you said, there, there was not a bid for that, and that was not an option that was necessarily even provided to us to integrate to their system. Um, and as the other you know, transit districts throughout Oregon are trying to figure out how to surmount the problem of digital payments, if we are more unified, then at a certain point there will be more of us, and or there will need to be an option provided. It gives us a better... Um, I think we have more weight when there are more of us, so. To Director Duncan's good point, um, Staff Director Dickey, you mentioned that it, in Lane, it's the MX only. Do, do the, the bus uh, in Lane Transit, do they utilize this? At this time, I do not believe they do, but that is something that I see as um, Well, now I'm pausing for just a moment. I, I may be getting, it may be the MX that is actually the one piece that isn't on it. It may be the bus that is on this. They are using this, I believe, on their bus system. The MX, when they first went out, was on a different system. And that, I believe, is, uh, is what would be transitioning in the future. But they, um, because it was with one of the other competitors that was not successful in this, this bid the MX was on that. Uh, so um, my apologies, that was, 
It is their bus system that is on the cubic dollar rock system and the MX was on the other system, which uh, was not successful. Okay. Right. Director Navarro. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So the question that I have is, um, would this system be able to recognize discounts for riders who qualify for discounted rates, or is this something that riders would have to, who do qualify for those rates, um, would have to purchase a pass or, or possibly like that smart card? So there would there would still be a, a validation piece that we would work with on that. That so the, so our current structure that allows for discounted passes based on. Uh, whatever qualifications that we have deemed in our fair policy. So currently that is uh, seniors, some pe people with disabilities and our youth uh, programs. Those are still going to be able to go forward. Those will still be able to be recognized and there will still be processes in place that when they pay, it will recognize them at those. If we choose to add other uh, categories of that, that is a a part of our process for determining our fair policy and our fair structures. But as uh, we mentioned before, is that whatever we choose our fair policy and structure to be, this system is able to adapt to that and adjust to that. So it, we're also not just locked into what we do the very first time and then we're stuck with that. It is something that has that flexibility, the capability um, to handle that um, it can handle zoned fares. It can handle different types of structures. So that's that was an important piece of this. Since we are utilizing this for both our local, regional, and our local and our regional system, it had to be able to recognize that as well, and those discount categories within each of those areas. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay, um, would someone like to make a motion? I move that the board authorize the general manager to execute a five-year contract with Del Rock Incorporated, a formerly owned subsidiary of Cubic Transportation Systems Incorporated for the purchase of their contactless fare payment system for use across Chariot's local and regional services and approve an overall project budget of $784,000, $784,000, Seven eight four zero zero three dollars. Bingo, she got it. Thank you. I second. We have a second on the motion. Any discussion on the motion? I actually have one last question. I'm out of turn, but uh, could any card with an, with the proper NFC coding be able to be used like this, or are we locked into purchasing two dollar cards from them in perpetuity? No, we are not actually locked into purchasing hard cards from this particular vendor. Uh, this is initially to get us started, but uh, any card that has uh, the proper proper NFC type of uh, chip in it uh, can be utilized that way. And in fact, in some cases, uh, uh, ID cards, uh, such as you know student ID cards, access ID cards, if they are equipped with dual chips, which in some cases they are, uh, there is the possibility, especially for like employer best pass programs, to be able to get their sequence of numbers and assign uh, accounts to those numbers as well. Okay, great. Any other, I'll say discussion, but any other last minute questions I also. Okay, uh, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. General Manager Pollock. Okay. I'll ask Greg Thompson to come back on for the next report. Thank you, and President Davidson, members of the board, good evening again. Uh, tonight, I'm asking the board to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Creative Bus Sales for the purchase of four Category B buses for use in the local fixed route service for an amount not to exceed $662,352. Chariot's current fleet for the delivery of the fixed route service consists of 64 ADA lift equipped lift equipped vehicles. These four vehicles would be an expansion of the fixed route service, bringing the total to 68. These four smaller buses would be used to right size the fleet and serve coverage routes that have, that have ridership that does not justify the use of larger buses. 
This right sizing of the fleet also alleviates concerns that have been raised by the public regarding the perception of large buses operating with little ridership. These buses will be used on Route 26 and 27 to serve the West Salem neighborhoods and could potentially be used on Route 14 and 12 in Kaiser as well. District staff performed research prior to beginning this procurement to ensure the smoothest transition to this fleet size. Considerations when selecting a vehicle were seating capacity, the ability to kneel, uh, a, mobility, a mobility ramp, approach angle that mirrors that of the current fixed route fleet. There were no category D alternative fuel vehicles available with these specifications, and these buses will be gasoline powered. Uh, I know that some people ask, uh, you know, what does it, what does a category D bus look like? So uh, we have some buses already operating in our, our ADA service. Uh, the, the buses we're proposing will, will mirror these that are we are currently using. This is an exterior picture of, of one when we first got it. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that the ease of access was important for people. And this is a picture of the, the wheelchair, the mobility device ramp uh, instead of a, an actual lift. Uh, so that, that means that if a person can board this bus, they can board any of our fixed route buses. Take a second to stop sharing. Manager Thompson? Yes. So that's not a cutaway. That's a category D vehicle. Category D is a is a cutaway. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, they they just go you know a fixed is it they name them by category. Category A is a is a large bus like it's in our local service. A category B is the large buses that have a ten year useful life that are in uh, our uh, regional service, and then they they kind of step down all the way down to an, an E one which is a van. So so that's how. Uh, the FTA and ODOT categorizes their buses by, by size. Got it. Thank you. So, so the, the category D buses is similar in size uh, to those, those buses I just showed. The, the contract price is based on the Oregon State Price Agreement procured under procedures set by the Oregon, the Oregon Department of Transportation's Public Transit Division. And the order will be for, for, will be for, for Category D buses for the regular fixed route service. Funding for the proposed contract will be included in the capital project budget of SAMTD's adopted fiscal year 22-23 budget. And the vehicle costs are listed in the table below, which include each bus as it has a price of $164,742 for a total of $658,968. Uh, we have a line item for the Oregon State Privilege Tax, which is for most items uh, on a bus, there are some things that are excluded was taxable, which is one half of 1% of the purchase price of the bus. That's uh, $803 per bus for a total of 3212 And then an Oregon trip permit, so the, the bus can be transported uh, from Portland to here, a $43 per bus for a total of $172, bringing the, the total request to $662,352. Funding for the proposed contract is covered through two grants using ODOT STIF discretionary funds and STIF formula funds. The STIF discretionary funds have an 80% 80 to 20% grant match amount so the grant would be for $524,765. The match amount is $131,191. And that, that stiff will cover $655,956. And the remaining $6,396 will be made uh, complete with the ODOT stiff formula funds for a total of $662,000. $352. Staff recommends that the board enter or authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Creative Bus Sales for the purchase of four Category D vehicles for use in the local fixed route service for an amount not to exceed $662,352. Okay. 
Any questions? Director Wynn? Thank you, President Davidson. My question is, um, I'm not familiar with the font color change previously in this docket. Is this a supplemental to a previous action? Or uh, what is staff's intention for the color change? Uh, Director Wynn, thank, thank you for that, that question. So the in the original board packet, uh, the pricing of the buses did not include the, that privilege tax. Uh, so we, we did redo this board report to reflect the, the total price. Uh, the the uh, uh, where the trip permit and the privilege tax weren't included. So we, that's that's why they're in blue to uh, show the difference. Thanks, Manager Thompson. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So the question that I have is about the vehicle's ability to kneel and the mobility ramp. Um, it looked like that the ramp was pretty steep. Um, from the picture that you sh that you showed us, but um, you did say that that vehicle is similar to these new ones. So I was wondering if that's the same issue. All right, Director Navarro, thank you for that question. It, yes, the picture can be somewhat deceiving. You know, sometimes with the when the ramp deploys on the ground or the ramp deploys on a sidewalk or a curb. But what we look for is when the buses knelt and the ramp deploys to the ground that ratio, that eight to one ratio, is identical and exact to what our local fixed route buses do for the, the same exact angle. That's reassuring, thank you. Manager Thompson, could you tell me what the expected useful life of this vehicle will be? Uh, these vehicles have, so we, we go by uh, we have some internal milestones and we have some uh, you know, uh, FTA and ODOT milestones. So those milestones are a, a five-year, 150,000, that's the minimum useful life. So that's, that doesn't say in five years the bus is done for. It just says you can start considering replacement after that, that point. Uh, internally, we, we increase those numbers slightly. We say it's seven years, 200,000 miles. Uh, typically in these services, our, our buses will reach age before they reach mileage. Um, so so we, we, we can reasonably keep those, those uh, the superior maintenance uh, in service longer than uh, ODOT and FTA recommend. That's a good pitch. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I guess, unsurprisingly say that I wish that there were was an alternative fuel option here, um, but I'm, it's, Nice to see that we'll that we're not locked in for like 15 years with a, a larger bus. So um, hopefully the market will mature a little bit more in the ensuing seven years. Thanks. Absolutely, that's that's one of our you know our goals or your goals, and we are we, that's what we consistently look for. We uh, we look at new technologies, new buses, uh, and, and uh, try to keep apprised as, as those things change. If there's no other questions or comments, uh, would someone like to make a motion? Please. Uh, I move that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Creative Bus Sales Inc. for the purchase of four Category D vehicles for the use in the local fixed route service for an amount not to exceed $662,352. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Sorry, uh, six. It looks like it says six hundred and sixty-two thousand three hundred fifty-two. Correct. We're good. Okay. Okay. Motion and second. Any discussion? Uh, I just want to note for the record what a great name that company has: Creative Bus Sales. So. That is all. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And no opposed, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Manager Thompson. Thank you. And? Manager Thompson. <laughs> hey, it's good to see everybody again. Uh, Director <laughs> Davidson, members of the board, thank you again. Uh, this is a this is an exciting request. Uh, this this furthers our, our case our cause for our uh, electrification of uh, Route 11. 
and, and inductive pickup charging. So tonight I'm asking the board to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Gillig LLC for the purchase of fixed route electric bus inductive chargers for use at Kaiser Transit Center for an amount not to exceed $518,590. Chariots was successfully awarded a fiscal year 21 low note grant. This award included the purchase of five electric buses, depot chargers at Del Webb, inductive pickup chargers at Kaiser Transit Center, as well as overall project management. Approval tonight will cover the inductive charger equipment for installation at the Kaiser Transit Center. Um, I, I do get kind of a side note if, if uh, people would indulge me, I do get a lot of questions about inductive pickup. What does it look like? What does it do? So I do have a, a quick video I'm going to share. Uh, and this is it's four minutes, so it's not too long. Uh, it does go over the same charger that we're going to use and how it was uh, employed in Wenatchee. Uh, so, and it'll kind of go over uh, how it works. So let me click. Greg, when you awesome. click share, there's a checkbox that you need to uh, select to make sure that you're sharing sound as well. So maybe stop share and then, oh, there you go. What we do has never been done before. So it's a thrill and it's very rewarding. We're paving the way and we're pioneers for a new system and technology. Inductive charging is the primary objective of our company. Transportation agencies are looking for ways to transition their fleets to electric buses. The problem is none of the electric buses today are able to drive as far as they need to drive on one charge. The people of Link Transit in Wenatchee, Washington called us and said, we think your solution is the one we're looking for. Wenatchee is a remarkable small city. It's the first place in the world that has a fully operational, high power automatic charger that can keep a bus fleet in operation all day. We're located in the power buckle of the United States, right on the Columbia River. We have 11 hydroelectric dams that generate power. So we realized early on that we wanted a technology that was going to be cleaner, simpler, and that's when we started to look for uh, magnetic inductive charging. The fundamentals of induction are that if you have an alternating current flowing through a conductor, that conductor will generate a magnetic field that wraps around the conductor and rotates around it. If you take the conductor, which could be a copper wire, and spool it into a coil, then the magnetic field that is generated will take the shape of a donut. If you put another coil directly above the first coil, the second coil will have a current induced in it by the magnetic field that's generated by the first coil. That's resonant magnetic induction. And that's what we use to transfer energy from the ground to the underside of the vehicle across an air gap. We entered into a contract with Momentum. They said, we can give you the first in the world 200 kilowatt charger for your facility. We can make that bus run enough to run any route in town. What's great about Wenatchee is it uses that clean energy, which then powers our charging systems to allow it to power the bus. Momentum Dynamics technology is a lightweight, cost-efficient, energy-efficient, powerful and fast automated solution for fueling electric vehicles. So this is our receiving end of our system. These are our receiving charging pads, which are getting the power from our transmitting pads to the receiving pads, which then brings all the power along to our management module, which will help manage the power that goes to our battery system. And that's how the battery gets charged. The beauty about this product is there is absolutely no moving parts. Momentum Charger worked the first time we put it in, and it's been absolutely trouble-free, and it is achieving exactly what we had hoped. 
14 months of continuous operation, we have not had a single interruption of service. And more importantly, we have proven the concept of opportunity charging for high utilization vehicles. It's an amazing feeling to know that you're on the cutting edge of technology and that we're leading the world in something that someday will be regular all over everywhere. The efficiency of inductive charging is better than conductive charging. It's less expensive. We have a generation two, and the best thing is we're going to more power and making it smaller. It's one thing to say you're green, but to actually put it in action and do it. That's where the innovation comes in. Wenatchee has proven that this is the right way forward. Momentum is going to be a big part of getting electric vehicle adoption to happen. I'm looking forward to seeing our charging systems everywhere. And hopefully that happens soon. All right, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Sorry about the, the sound faux pas there. So, so as you can see in the video, the inductive chargers are installed flush to the ground and charge the bus with a magnetic field uh, once the bus is positioned directly over that pad. Charging buses at Kaiser Transit Center each time a bus arrives for a small period of time allows for that bus to stay in service all day long. All 10 battery electric buses will be equipped with the components on the underside of the bus to facilitate that charge. There are no moving charger parts. Chariot staff in collaboration with our project consulting firm, CTE, which is Center for the Transit, for Transit and the Environment, and our bus manufacturer, Gillig, have researched the, the two main vendors that build inductive chargers. Momentum Dynamics was found to provide the highest rate of charge and a superior warranty. Additionally, Gillick has successfully tested Momentum Dynamics inductive chargers in their previous bus builds with success. A total of two inductive chargers will be installed at Transit Kaiser Transit Center to support the charging of Route 11. The cost of the chargers include a two-year warranty and shipping. Funding for this proposed contract will be included in the capital projects budget of SAMTD's adopted fiscal year 22-23 budget. And an itemized itemization of costs is outlined in the table one below. So we're we are doing 300 kilowatt in char, in route charging pads of 259,295 dollars each, quantity of two. Uh, for a total of $518,590. Uh, and this includes warranty and this includes shipping. Funding for the proposed contract is covered through the fiscal year 21 low no 5339C grant. Funds for the two inductive chargers to be used at Kaiser Transit Center are listed in the table below. And that, that fiscal year 21 low no grant award is a 8515 match. The grant amount is $440,801, and the match amount is $77,789 for the total of $518,590. Staff recommends that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Gillig LLC for the purchase of fixed route electric bus inductive chargers for use at Kaiser Transit Center for an amount not to exceed $518,590, and I will answer any questions. Any questions for Manager Thompson? Please. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, Manager Thompson, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm really excited underneath this mask over here. Um, when you read the issue, I did a celebratory shimmy in my chair because this is, this is really awesome. I'm excited to be a part of this and uh, look forward to voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Director Navarro. Thank you for including that video. I have, uh, this is not the only industry that's trying to tackle these problems of not having vehicles that quite fit the bill yet. And that information makes it very clear, easily accessible. And I'm really thankful that you provided such a great and uh, accessible resource because I will probably be using it in other avenues of my life. So thank you for that uh, overview and for all of the work that you did to find such a specialized, specific solution to our problem. It sounds like this is not widely implemented yet and it's excited to be on the front of that. So thank you. We, we will be, it'd be interesting to know, we will be one of the few. So Wenatchee has done, their primary is inductive pickup. We will be one of the 
first adopters of having both depot charging and uh, inductive pick pickup charging on the same bus. So, so there are some things that we are kind of leading the, the path on uh, in, in this entire project. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Thank you, Director Duncan. Director Wynn. Thanks, President Davidson. Uh, I just want to appreciate the fact that uh, it was Wenatchee because my first thought that came to mind was, how's this going to hold up to um, the induction uh, ability affected by ground cover like rain or snow or ice? So great, great case study to uh, uh, allay my fears. Thank you. Great. Um, and I just want to say that I really appreciate the audio visuals tonight, but in particular the video. Uh, while I do not doubt your skills, Manager Thompson, I, part of me wishes that you would have tried to explain induction charging with your hands. <laughs> the video route probably was better though, so uh, good choice. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, would someone like to make a motion? Director Navarro. I move the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with Gilling LLC for the purchase of fixed route electric bus inductive chargers for use at Kaiser Transit Center for an amount not to exceed $518,590. I second. All right. Dynamic duo up here. Uh, with a motion and a second, any discussion? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. And for the final uh, action item tonight, I'll present the staff report. Uh, so this item is asking the board to approve uh, the district's participation in the American Public Transportation Association's uh, racial equity commitment pilot program. Uh, back in November, uh, when APTA convened its board, uh, they approved the uh, Racial Equity Commitment Pilot Program. And this program is designed to provide a tangible roadmap for APTA members to advance racial equity in their organizations as part of a broader commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. The pilot program uh, in, incorporates five core principles, uh, and I'm going to read them because I think they're important to, to, uh, to talk about. One, make racial equity an explicit strategy priority for your organization. Undertake an annual diversity, equity, and inclusion climate assessment on the perceived employee experience of existing policies, practices, and procedures. Review and analyze demographic data covering both what is internal as well as external to an organization. Put in place evidence-informed policies, practices, programs, and processes for creating and maintaining an inclusive and equitable environment for employees and customers and establishes programs, tools, and dedicated resources. The pilot program is over a two-year period and the attachment outlines the expectations in both year one and year two. Uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Board Subcommittee uh, met on February 8th to review the purpose, requirements, and elements of the program and the subcommittee felt this pilot program fit nicely into our larger DEI program that's currently under development. So tonight, uh, the DEI subcommittee is recommending that the board authorize the general manager to submit the signatory commitment form and enroll the districts into the racial equity commitment pilot program. Any questions? While folks are maybe thinking of questions, I just wanted to um, voice my support for this. Um, I was at the APTA conference uh, back in November where they um, partially unveiled this. And I think it's a wonderful initiative that I'm hopeful that we can sign on to officially. Uh, one thing that they stressed that I wanted to echo here is that this is uh, about making us as an agency and as an industry stronger, both collectively and individually, and that um, this is not about, this has nothing to do with anything punitive. This is not a handout. This is, this is about uh, empowering individuals uh, within our agency and within the transit industry as a whole. So helping uh, everyone succeed. And so I'm, I'm 
really excited to uh, officially sign on to this. Okay, if there's no other questions, um, Director Navarro, would you like to make a motion? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, I move that the board authorize the general manager to submit the signatory commitment form and enroll the district into a racial equity commitment pilot program. I second. Okay. We got a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, so that completes our action items on the agenda, though we have uh, informational reports next. Great, thank you. I'll ask Chris French, our service planning manager, to please come on the line. There he is, Chris. Good evening. Good evening. Good, sorry. Uh, Ross, I believe you were gonna share the slides. Thank you. And good evening, President Davidson, members of the board. I'm here this evening to present a FY22 quarter two performance report. Uh, this covers December, October through December of 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, first, we'll look at ridership totals for FY22 quarter two. Next slide. So year to date for weekdays, uh, we've provided just over 900,000 rides across all of our services on weekdays. Next slide. On Saturdays, uh, for all services uh, on Saturdays that operate, uh, we've provided just under 89,000 rides. Next slide. <clears throat> And this is the first report that I really get to talk about Sundays. And uh, for our Sunday service, uh, we provided just over 25,000 rides. Next slide. And for all year to date across all services, uh, the ridership is 1,015,870 rides um, between all of the services. Next slide. Uh, Next, we'll be looking at uh, ridership averages. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is looking at daily average ride uh, per month uh, with weekdays slightly up um, for over FY21 and Saturdays slightly down, but very comparable uh, across. And at this point, we don't have the year over year comparison for Sundays. Next slide. Uh, and this slide is for the regional average daily ridership. Uh, weekdays, October and November were slightly up and December uh, we saw a slight decrease over last year and uh, Saturdays were very comparable, uh, pretty much even almost. Next slide. Next we'll be looking at weekday average by route. Next slide. So for the corridor routes, our top performer was the Route 3 Portland Road, and we were at 18.6 boardings per revenue hour. Um, this is approaching close to uh, the 20 boardings that we have set for our target. So that's encouraging to see that uh, rides per revenue hour are starting to come back. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, for weekdays, for the co coverage routes, uh, Route 16 uh, was uh, our top performer, Wallace Road, and we've actually, this is our first route that has surpassed our target boarding since the pandemic. Next, right, next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is weekday rides per revenue hour for the regional, and these are still down, but are slowly coming back with the Route 40X uh, providing uh, 5.1 boardings uh, per revenue hour. Next slide. Next, we're looking at Saturday averages. Next slide. And for Saturdays, for the local corridors, uh, 19 and 21 were the top performers with 14.6 boardings per revenue hour. Next slide. And Saturdays, uh, the coverage routes. Uh, once again, Route 16 is performing quite well with 8.8 boardings per revenue hour. Next slide. 
And for our regional system, uh, for Saturdays, the 40X is our still our top performer with 4.4 or 3.3 boardings per revenue hour. Next slide. Next, we'll look at Sunday averages. And 21 is our top performing route for Sundays. And that is uh, the route 21 at 12.7. So to kind of, we talk about boardings per revenue hour and just to kind of give context because we talk about weekday uh, with the top performers and, and Saturdays and Sundays, I wanted to kind of give, so weekday local rides like across all services, uh, Rides per revenue hour are 11.5 for weekdays. On Saturdays, uh, rides per revenue hour are 9.8, and Sunday is 7.9. So we see there, you look and see a lot of variation day to day when you're comparing the service by revenue hour. But if you look at across, they're, they're very close for um, how many rides we're providing per revenue hour. Next slide. So uh, this is a new piece that uh, we've added to the report, and this is revenue hours and miles, uh, looking at them across uh, the years. And we have from FY15 uh, through 21. And next slide. You can see that um, this is our revenue hours building over time. And in 2019, uh, we had 167, almost 168,000 revenue hours. And in 21, we provided 182, over 182,000 uh, revenue hours. Um, with the uh, pandemic, we would have expected to see those, the uh, 20, uh, year be up and we would have expected to have provided um, closer to 190,000 revenue hours uh, in FY21 and for this year coming up. Um, looking at FY19, the jump that we took there was the extension of the Route 11 that we did. Uh, it used to end on Lancaster at Ricky. And we, when the Amazon facility opened, we added revenue hours to that service and extended it all the way uh, down to the Mill Creek Business Center. Next slide. And similar, similarly to the revenue hours, revenue miles have followed that track as well. And this is for the local system. Next slide. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'll kick it off with one question. On the total revenue miles, there's a peak in fiscal year 17 um, for total revenue miles. And I have a guess of why that is, but before I embarrass myself, I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe partially explain why there was that peak there. Uh, President Davidson, I am going to have to do uh, some, some looking into that and get back to you. I, I don't have that off the top of my head. That's all right. Could, could I maybe posit my, uh, my guess and then you can uh, let me know how wrong I am later? Uh, if, I'm Definitely. if I'm remembering correctly, is that around the time that we did the service or uh, map redesign, the system redesign? It was in. The, it was somewhere close in that time period. I, um, but I'm. I just. I. That very well could be. But I will uh, do some research okay. and uh, provide some insight on that. Okay. Thank you. And I, I just want to offer a comment that I love seeing the total revenue hour chart. I love the trajectory. I, I love it all. So thanks for sharing that. Other questions? Director Wynn. All right, thank you, President Davidson. Um, I would be uh, remiss to not bring up some recent conversations where uh, I've been able to interface with some of our frontline staff and just share my deep appreciation for their service being on the front line through the pandemic. And uh, what's been struck up in these conversations has been, I can see now the quantitative uh, data that show why they're bringing forward some qualitative concerns. As we reemerge 
from the last two years worth of kind of being a very sleepy state and folks are just getting out and using public transit again. I'm hoping that our operations team can build in some time onto the routes so that way drivers can um, actually make a solid connection with folks that have been, um, uh, I guess, we're re-emerging, right? And uh, so that way then, one, we don't lose the service because we know it's it's going to take some time getting used to the um, uh, the, qu the the quantity, right? The pressure of I got to make my route on time, um, but I think folks are just deeply needing uh, that that connection to uh, to others and and being out and about and being in community one, uh, with one another. So um, I'm just wanting to bring kind of the the wisdom that they were so graciously able to share with me on their off time uh, on the in the grocery store lines. Um, so I thought that this would be a, a good forum for that if we can think about that. Thanks, Director Wynn. Um, I have maybe just a quick question to make sure I understand the, the comment, Director Wynn. Are you referring to the, the transfer connections of riders or the, the time marks of operators? It's the latter. Okay. I, I hear what, what I'm hearing is that they're feeling very pressed for time. There's not, um, it, it, it's more about demand management than it is about uh, what, and one come to mind as they, he had a lot more historics to um, gauge. And, and I said, is it because it's, it's a change coming back from the pandemics? And he's like, no, I, I've been in, in the force for quite some time and I've really felt it get shorter and shorter and more demand is to meet, you know, like make my route time versus the world-class experience I was able to offer by having a much more deep connection with the riders previously. Got it, thank you. Um, I don't know if this data is available, but to maybe Director Wynn's point, it would be interesting to see on-time performance data. Um, and. Um, as, as we think about performance more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, President Davidson, that is something uh, that um, is very, we, we are very interested in sharing as well. Um, yep, I look yeah. forward to the CAD AVL piece. Yes. Great. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. Well, I, th oh, I think that does it for uh, us tonight. Thank you very much, Manager French. Thank you, have a good evening. Okay, and I'll ask Roxanne Belts to present the Transportation Options Report. Good evening, President Davidson, members of the board. Can you hear me all right? We can. Excellent. So I'm here to present the Transportation Options Program's second quarter report. Next slide, please. So in our goal area of awareness and understanding, next slide, we attended 28 service integration team meetings, 18 chamber functions, and three downtown business association meetings. These are meetings that are in Dallas, McMinnville, and then the Monmouth Independence area, and then three downtown, uh, the three downtown business association meetings in those three towns. Uh, next slide, please. We also have continued with our community outreach. We've attended 12 board and commission meetings, three Polk County leadership meetings, and three ribbon cuttings for new businesses that have opened in uh, either Dallas, Monmouth, or Independence. Next slide, please. In our area of expanded markets. Next slide. As we continue to expand our outreach, we actually have grown participation in the Get There Oregon tool. Um, which is the tool that individuals can use to find opportunities to ride, match, or to track their trips. Um, we have now 1,575 active users within our region. So that is Polk, Marion, and Yamhill County. Next slide, please. Part of the growth, of course, comes from the challenges that we have. We finished up the Get There Challenge the end of October, um, and this is sponsored by ODOT. So it's a statewide challenge, and you can see there were 
1,405 statewide participants, but of those participants, 121 of them were in our region. And those 121 participants unlocked achievements, 1,345 achievements, things like watching a video or learning to fix their bike or um, even learning about improving their Wi-Fi if they're teleworking. And then those individuals logged um, 1,735 trips and those trips were using either telework or using a transportation option to get to work. Next slide, please. This is something I am so excited about to talk about van pools. You know, we've had a van pool program for decades um, we currently support 24 vans in Polk, Marion and Yamhill County. And 10 of those vans are now um, coming to and from Maduri Farms into Salem, into other areas. Maduri Farms is just in rural Dallas and uh, their management approached me um, mid last year and said they were having trouble with employee retention and employee recruitment and that they knew that their employees could use a better way to get to work. So we worked with our partner, um, Commute by Enterprise. Starting in October, we added one van, then another van, then another van. Now we're up to 10 vans going out there every day. That's 50, that's serving 50 different employees. We've saved 42 parking spaces because now all those employees are not driving alone. They're driving in the van. We've reduced 445,000 vehicle miles traveled just between October and January, reduced 350,000 pounds of CO2 emissions, and we're saving that those employees are saving $167,000. And so this is, this is a wonderful success story. I hope that we get to continue with the Vampool program. Certainly Midori Farms is talking to their friends in the industry through SEDCOR and they're letting people know, go to Chariots. Chariots can help you set up a program. Next slide, please. As my colleague Kiki Doman told you last quarter, she reported that she participated with a statewide advisory group that's been looking at ways that transportation options programs like ours can work with the limited English proficiency communities so after they had some community and stakeholder interviews, they did develop a guiding document. And that document addresses core principles like how to build trust within the community, identifying needs and barriers, identifying solutions, addressing and improving perception of transit and then build our transportation options and then building confidence in using a transportation option. So the document's not intended to be exhaustive, but it um, it is, it is intended to serve as a starting point for building a thoughtful and intentional and comprehensive approach um, that transportation option programs in Oregon can have when they start working with, um, working more with the limited English proficiency communities. Next slide, please. Um, so on to a few of our program activities. Next slide. Well, hopefully you all had a chance to see the video that Stephen Custer and I made with our spokes puppet Jabber. Um, it's had about 400 views now on YouTube and it is spreading a really positive message about safe walking, driving and cycling and how everybody can share the road if they just pay attention to one another. Um, our next project will be a video where we're showing various trip planning tools that Chariots offers. Um, this video won't have a puppet um, but there might be, there might be a Bigfoot sighting. So you never know. Next slide, please. So I do want to thank you for your time and your attention tonight and for your time and attention over the last 16 and a half years. Um, this is my 60th board presentation and it's my last one. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Coordinator Belts. Before uh, we go to questions, I wanted to maybe just hi highlight a little bit about your career. So as uh, Roxanne just mentioned, 16 years with Chariots. So not only uh, does that mean in terms of tenure, she would be able to operate, operate a single occupancy vehicle. However, she chooses to ride the bus. So at least this 16, anyways, that was a bad joke. Um, I wanted to also just highlight that uh, this is what happens when I write my own jokes. Um, so um, that not only the uh, coordinator belts serve the public at Chariots, but uh, since 2017, she's been on the Monmouth City Council. And so while uh, she won't be here at uh, future Chariots board meetings, I will still have the pleasure of serving with her on the uh, Mid Willamette Valley Council of Government. So I'm looking forward to that. And so 
wanted to indulge you all and maybe uh, cover a few highlights from her career. So she designed and coordinated the Salem Station Activity Center at the Gilbert's Children's Museum, uh, which my daughter adores, so thank you. Um, she managed and designed the Wander Walks mapping project. She coordinated and designed the creation of the Marion and Polk County bike maps, helped design and secure grant funding for the Salem-Kaiser Safe Routes to School program, and then, as she mentioned, uh, along with Stephen Custer, created the Share the Road video that was recently released. However, what she didn't mention was that she actually created Jabber, um, the spokes puppet, which is no small feat. And then uh, during her tenure, she uh, has received numerous awards and recognition. I'll highlight just a few. Uh, in 20, 2007, she uh, received the Addy, which uh, was for rideshare collateral redesign. Uh, twice received the To Go Program of the Year, received an Ad Wheel Award for an ad promotion that I need to find. It's called Love the New Bus Smell. Um, and then uh, ACT uh, for Best Commuting Option Collateral in 2016. So uh, on behalf of the board and of the agency, Courtney and Belts, thank you very much for your years of service. Thank you. I, I appreciate that very, very much. I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> Well, I'll open it up to other board members to for comments, questions, or accolades. Please. You cry, I cry, don't cry. Um, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate all of your service. It's, I know that I've not been on the board very long, but even just in this small amount of time that I've been here with the creation of Jabber and the, um, these programs are some of my favorite updates to hear about, or the, all of the things that we're doing in the community. I'm sure the other board members can attest that that's one of my favorite parts about the job is going and being in the community and talking to people and what you guys do and making sure that we're in as many rooms as possible is is massive and is what gives us the visibility and that interconnectivity that people want with us to see what we're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you, Director Duncan. Okay. Director Wynn. Thank you, President Davidson. Oh, coordinator belts. We've had our years, haven't we? Uh, as colleagues, I used to uh, participate in the transportation fairs along with coordinator belts where we're like, please take the swag so that way we don't have to bring it back to the office. <laughs> 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 Engaging with travel uh, and transportation coordinators, assembling van pools together. So I've worked with her in different capacities. I appreciate the opportunity to say uh, a, a solid farewell it's Oregon after all, it's a goodbye for now. Mm -hmm. We'll run into each other as uh, President Davidson has said, um, but thank you so much. You single-handedly have removed so many EVMTs and uh, prevented so many folks from, here's a, here's a joke coming up for you, Ian, uh, <laughs> prevented many SOVs from Ooh. happening. So- You have um, a better joke from, writer. <laughs> <laughs> from the bottom of my heart, Thank you for all that you've done for our community, for our state, and just, you know, it, it, it really came down to you helped put together programs that made sense for the employers, as well as the employees and folks that um, really found it beneficial to have those emergency ride homes, those, uh, you know, Again, Vanpool, you have me sold because it, it is the most efficient vehicle miles because we have to track occupancy. Not very many other transit options do uh, in order to get the federal dollars, the matching that we do. But thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other before long. Thank you, Director Wynn. Yeah, I, I know that we'll be seeing each other again. We run in the same circles. Please. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, Coordinator Belts, I haven't had it. I haven't been with the board long enough to really get a chance to know you. But what I do know is that Chariots is a world-class transportation experience, and I have no doubt that that's due in part to you being on Team Chariots. Thank you, Director Navarro. I appreciate that very much. It's it's been a wonderful time. I, I really appreciate the time I've spent here. And um, I keep joking, retirement is April 1st, and it's really not a joke. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have 30 something days left, and uh, I plan on using them to the fullest. And I will continue 
to support chariots as a world-class customer organization. I'll, I'll be around. I'm not going away. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and proceed to the second quarter financial report. All right. Thanks. I'll ask Denise LaRue, our CFO, to please come on and present the report. Good evening, President Davidson and members of the board. Tonight, I'm happy to present the FY22 second quarter finance report. The board adopts the budget for the district on an annual basis, and the budget is a plan that contains district resources and requirements. The quarterly finance report provides information about how that plan is being implemented and includes statements for the general fund, special transportation fund, and capital project fund. The finance report also includes budget to actual on a non-GAAP basis that shows by fund the legal appropriations by category with actual amounts and variances. In the general fund revenues, passenger fares are currently at 76% of the annual budget, which is very encouraging after the last couple of years. Federal funding is currently at 0% of the annual budget. The FTA has had delays in processing grant applications. The application for the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act or CRISA funds have just been processed by the FTA, so we will be be receiving the drawdown revenues in the third quarter. The district received 102% of the projected property taxes in the second quarter of the year. This amount reflects the payments received in November of 2021 when the bulk of property taxes are collected. There will be small amounts recognized in third and fourth quarter. This is the normal uh, pattern for collecting the property taxes. Interest on investments is slightly less than budget for the second quarter. Interest rates will fluctuate throughout the year. For general fund expenditures, the total operating expenditures of the general fund are under budget at 42% of total annual budget. All divisions in the general budget, or in the general fund, excuse me, are at or below the anticipated 50% of total budget, ranging from 33% to 50% of annual budget expended. Many divisions have had vacant positions and also there has been very little travel to date due to COVID-19. Transportation program fund revenues also show passenger revenues are at 64% of the budget. Once again, very encouraging. As with the general fund, federal funds have not been reimbursed yet due to the timing of application approvals, but we also will see those uh, drawdown reimbursements in the third quarter. And transfers from other funds are all recognized at the end of the fiscal year. Transportation fund expenditures are at 34% of annual budget. All divisions are in line with spending less than one half of the annual budgeted amount. For capital project fund revenues, the capital uh, revenues are at 2% of total budget with only in the second quarter because the revenues are recorded when we are reimbursed by the granting federal or state agency. One item to note is the miscellaneous revenues consist of reimbursement from the city of Kaiser for the KTC signalization project. The capital uh, project fund expenditures are at 2% of the annual approved budget. Some of the larger projects that have been, that have had expenditures are the South Salem Transit Center bus stops and shelters, and the local revenue vehicles. Our very large projects that have been budgeted take time to complete and then submit for reimbursement. Staff recommends that the board receive and file the second quarter financial report for FY 2021-22. May I answer any questions for you? Any questions for CFO LaRue? I have one, maybe two questions. Um, on the first page of your memo, you identify that passenger fares are currently 76% of the annual budget. I Help me understand what that means. Is that 76% of the projected revenues from passenger fares? It's 76% of what we actually budgeted for this year. So normally we would be at 50% at this time because we're through second quarter, but we're already up to 76%. Okay. 
Got it. Okay, thank you. And I imagine that's because when we budgeted, we were conservative because we were unsure of how the pandemic. Okay. Exactly. And then, oh, please. And we are seeing some increased ridership. Good point. And then could you help me understand the difference between the passenger fares that live in the general fund versus the passenger fares that live in the transportation program fund? The passenger fares in the transportation program fund are the uh, not our normal everyday um, bus routes, not our, our direct routes. And the general fund are our routes, so, our, our normal routes. It's not our, our lift or any of that. Yeah, yeah. So the general fund is the local service. Uh -huh. Transportation fund is the regional service and chariots lift. Got it. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I had. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, CFO LaRue. And now uh, we proceed to the general manager's report. All right. Thank you. I just have a couple of items to report. Uh, first, if you recall, a couple of months ago, you uh, approved a contract with TransPro Consulting for strategic planning services. Happy to say we're well into the work. Uh, last week, the executive leadership team uh, met in a retreat with the TransPro consultants and, and began that process, looking at our vision, mission, values, our work plan, our priorities, uh, and put together a, a, good, a good piece of work. Uh, the next step of that is uh, uh, the individual one-on-one -on -one board interviews, which we'll be setting up uh, beginning today, uh, and then also some community stakeholder interviews. Uh, we'll take all that information. Uh, while you're doing that, staff be, will be working on some work plan tactics and strategies. Uh, uh, ultimately, and then coming back with all of that information end of May, sometime in June, for a board retreat to review all that and, and start to finalize a plan uh, for final board approval. So uh, lots of work going on in that arena. Uh, if you didn't hear today, uh, Governor Brown uh, announced that she uh, is lifting Oregon's COVID-19 emergency declaration beginning or effective April 1st. Uh, she talked about that as a result of all the work that's been done in the past to reduce uh, hospitalizations and uh, uh, positive rates. Uh, but she does uh, quotes in her release, and it's still important to remember that COVID-19 is still present in Oregon and we must remain vigilant, continue to get vaccinated and boosted, wear masks when necessary, and if you're sick, stay home. In addition to her announcement, the Oregon Health Authority also announced that they will be lifting their mask mandate uh, for indoor public spaces, places in Oregon schools beginning March 19th, uh, while they also still recommend those that are in high risk groups to continue to wear masks indoors in public settings, even though there is no mask mandate. Uh, so what does that mean to chariots? Well, in addition to the state mandates, uh, we are also subject to the TSA requirements and they have a mask mandate uh, for airlines and, and transit buses uh, that uh, actually expires uh, or March 18th, the day before uh, OHA's mass mandate lifted. So we, we will be watching what they say also, because if they do extend their mass mandate, even though the rest of Salem and Kaiser can uh, eliminate that, we will still be subject to that order. So we will, uh, once we hear, and we expect to hear fairly soon about that, they usually don't wait till the last day to announce it. Uh, we will issue guidance for our employees and our customers uh, based on th that final guidance. If, uh, you know, the, the short version is if the TSA lets their mandate sunset, and then you know, we kind of will, will follow that guidance as well. If they extend it, uh, uh, we will continue to enforce the rules, which does kind of make it difficult if the rest of everyone is not wearing a mask, you still have to wear it on us. But either way, we will follow the guidance and, and uh, implement uh, as necessary. And I think that concludes my report for tonight. Great. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. 
Um, we'll proceed to the Board of Directors reports. Um, for members of the board, I'll direct your attention to page 111 in the board packet. And uh, like usual, we'll proceed in numerical order. So Subdistrict 1, Director Wynn. Thank you, President Davidson. Um, I guess I will uh, open up my remarks tonight with um, a lesson I've learned recently from a mentor that says the universe organizes around your intentions. And uh, I'll speak from my lived experience of having been displaced, my family and I as political refugees, to share that I have heaviness in my heart tonight for though I do not have any connections uh, to uh, Ukraine or Russia, uh, I know personally that um, uh, war is, is, is not a good thing. And uh, I'd like for us to set our intention that uh, they can reach peace and resolution for their conflicts. Um, I've had to lose my grandfather, who is a, a colonel, in the uh, Army Rangers. And uh, so just want to um, pause for a moment to hold those that are affected um, at home and, and abroad. Before I make comments uh, from my DEI committee assignment, So since last month's report, um, Keen, Keen Consulting uh, has completed virtual workshops with contracted transportation staff and employee focus group. They've also interviewed procurement and security staff. They've continued reviewing and analyzing common DEI training curricula implemented by other transit agencies and public agencies. They've continued analyzing DEI communication strategies by transit agencies as well as best practices regarding DEI and they've began preparing a summary report uh, and supporting appendices. Some have been submitted to Chariot staff for review and comment, uh, and they've also began developing the DEI plan document. And uh, as you remember, uh, they came last month to do a board presentation. Um, outside of that, uh, I uh, have been in contact with uh, leadership at the West Salem Neighborhood Association, but have not personally been able to attend um, and have not been able to attend the West Salem Business Association. So I apologize for not having um, much of an update there. Uh, the WISNA contact did not have, uh, their transportation coordinator did not have any um, thing that they needed me to lift up in tonight's chariot meeting. And that concludes my reports. Thank you, Director Wynn. Director Navarro. Thank you, uh, President Davidson. So, um, well, sorry, that was just really heavy. And thank you, Director Grant Gwen, for, um, for sharing that with us tonight um, and having the courage to, to speak up on that. Um, uh, going back to my report, um, I had the opportunity to attend Mayor Chuck Bennett's uh, State of the City this month. Um, it's his last State of the City as he plans not to seek reelection. Um, I want to thank Mayor Bennett for um, all the awesome work he's done for the city of Salem and for Oregonians in general, but I'll let uh, Director Duncan recap on, on that. Um, in Kaiser news, uh, we got a new city manager. So for those unfamiliar with Kaiser's search, our last city manager resigned in April of 2021 um, after discharging a firearm in the workplace. And since then, Kaiser's been on the hunt for a new city manager. Um, it's been a long journey, but... Um, they finally, uh, they finally um, chose Mr. Brown, Adam Brown. Um, uh, so Mr. Brown brings with him 25 years of experience working with local governments and served the last six years as the city manager of Ontario. Uh, while I'm, I haven't had a chance to personally meet Mr. Brown, uh, I'm excited about him taking on this new position as I understand that he has uh, some experience with transportation agencies and uh, look forward to working with Chariots to, to bring them up to speed on all the awesome things that we have going on here. Thank you, Director Navarro. Uh, next up is me. So um, for this month, uh, attended MWAC, Mid Willamette Valley Advisory Commission on Transportation. Uh, not a whole lot to report that's relevant to the, uh, the board. Just wanted to, I guess, reiterate that the discussions around the 
Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is ongoing at a whole lot of tables, including ours. Um, I've also been active with the Mid Willamette Valley Council of Governments Legislative Committee or Legislative Subcommittee. Uh, it's a weekly 7 a.m. meeting uh, during the short legislative session. And one of the key legislative priorities for the COG is to uh, s receive some state assistance to support COGS across the state to execute on some of their needs. Because unlike Metro, which is a council of government uh, like entity, uh, it does not have independent taxing authority. And it serves a pretty important uh, need for communities across the state. So having this additional state funding uh, would allow them to execute on their mission of uh, serving communities of varying sizes. Um, speaking of Council of Governments, uh, earlier this month they had their annual meeting, which uh, due to uh, the re realities of a pandemic was held virtually. Um, so there were updates around um, the successes of the Council of Government, including uh, several awards. Um, also, awards were distributed to um, public servants, both elected and appointed. And I had the opportunity to um, <coughs> be the one to hand, or I guess virtually hand, uh, an award, the Gwen Vandenbosch Award uh, that recognizes the work of an elected official and uh, Kaiser Mayor Kathy Clark received that. It was actually split, but I was, I was the one that was able to uh, virtually award that to uh, Mayor Clark. She's been a huge um, advocate for chariots and it was wonderful to see her recognized in that way. Uh, Mayor Swenson, and Woodburn shared or received that award as well this year. And then um, earlier this month, I had the opportunity to meet with the TransPro consultants who were in town uh, visiting with the executive leadership team. So it was a good opportunity to chat with them about uh, the board perspective of what we were hoping to get from them to continue the conversation that we had with them uh, at the prior board meeting. And with that, that concludes my report. So Director Duncan. Thank you very much. Uh, so I attended the State of the City uh, with Director Navarro, um, and there was quite a bit talked about. There's a lot going on in the City of Salem. It is, uh, was, was his last, uh, our current mayor's last uh, State of the City. But there were a couple of um, particular things that he touched on that I think that as a transit board that we should keep in mind. Um, in particular, uh, he cited an, a major increase in the amount of needing new officers specifically to uh, focus on pedestrian safety and traffic enforcement, um, and uh, really touched on calls going unanswered, call times for in the highlight of traffic. And so I think that, um, and this is something we've talked about in SCATS a lot, is the contribution of transit to an increased level of safety in the community. And in my free time, I've been spending a lot more time looking at communities around the world that have lower rates of mortality per, um, per, per, per capita in comparison to where, we, to where we are. And a lot of it has to do with infrastructure, not necessarily law enforcement. And I think that is, um, as we go forward, I wanna see if what we can do to continue to, to educate and bring some of those newer um, ideas to the forefront of this conversation because uh, I really wanna make sure that we're addressing the needs of the community. And if those are infrastructure needs and we're able to help provide that, it's our job to you know, step forward and make that educated response because it isn't the knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but I'm hoping for support from, from everyone else as we kind of like move forward and are, are able to help in that because I do think there's a lot that uh, as the transit district, we can really provide some insight there of, of other, um, of ways to support that knowing that those, those funds we have no control over but we do have control of ourselves and it is an issue that we're committed to and doing what we can to help with. So. I thought that was interesting. I also really uh, wanted to touch on, they talked a lot about um, the economy and how we're just doing a lot better as a city. There's so many more small businesses and our downtown economy is thriving. And those businesses need transit to bring their customers to their doors. And especially uh, talking about tourism and how uh, we have more individuals in our community that are from outside of the state than before. They cited the, Ider the Iron Man at the Rotary uh, Amphitheater that happened in downtown. That's huge. Uh, when people come to our city, 
we want them to be able to get around it. We want them to not necessarily have to be uh, to reliant on um, Ubering everywhere. We would like to see them use you know, transit, which is a much more accessible option. Uh, and so there, I just see uh, so many areas that really transit is, is going to be serving the city with all of the new things going forward. And there's just a lot of places that I see us fitting in. And I was really, really excited about that and uh, looking forward to being able to work more with the city council and you know, other members that are interested in, uh, in, in, in bringing that vision about. So just some areas I think we can add and some areas I think we're already doing good. And overall, it was a really great event. So that was that piece. And then I am gonna also deliver the SCATS report um, for Director Carney uh, since I, I stood in for them this, this time around. Um, that was a little off the cuff, so I'll do my best here. But there really were two main topics to cover. Uh, the SCATS committee is moving forward with their public participation plan, which um, means that they're about to send out 20,000 postcards, which is the first time they've done this particular mailer. They've not done a mailer in the past. There is a QR code on the mailer, and they should be able to track how many people use this, which I think is really helpful, at least for us as well as a transit district, is um, getting some metrics on how effective mailers potentially even are um, as far as different modes of, uh, of getting Communi communication out, especially as we're doing our own studies and looking to try to engage the community. They're particularly trying to use census data to target underserved postal routes in particular. And uh, so I am really interested to see what the return on the investment is given the cost of this type of project, um, especially given, you know, like uh, online ad advertising technically reaches more people, but I know that they're looking for a specific uh, targeted approach that they feel is best done in a physical manner, but I'm really excited to see uh, what the return on that investment is and if we can utilize that information ourselves in the future. Um, there is an ODOT open house uh, to give comment uh, going forward on a, a bunch of different topics that are coming up. I believe that's March 8th, and you can check those out at the odotopenhouse.org. I know one of the topics that they touched on um, was rail crossings, so please, please check those out as they come up. Um, and then the last piece also had to do with the IIJA funding. Um, really, the last piece, uh, there, was, there was a bit of a change in the provided, op the official provided options are still the same. Uh, we talked a little bit at the last meeting how there was an unofficial option. Uh, they informed us that that unofficial option has changed slightly, but I have not seen the text of the bill, so I can't talk on that. And we didn't really touch on it much in the meeting other than that has changed, and I wanted to provide that update. Um, additionally, they're uh, inviting comment, but only from entities that have not already provided comment is really what they're encouraging. Uh, and so that would really, that leaves from our, our group, the city of Salem, and we do have a new uh, uh, representative, or at least we did at this meeting um, from city of Salem. Uh, city Councilor Trevor Phillips was uh, in attendance and would potentially be the one to help out with that. And I'm really looking forward to, move, to working with him. He's from my district and so, I, we've met before, and uh, I'm really uh, hopeful that we'll be able to um, work together and get some get some good stuff passed in the future. So, that's my report. Thank you, Director Duncan. Um, with that, uh, that concludes all the items on our agenda. So we will adjourn. Thank you very much, and thank you to those that helped make this meeting run smoothly, and for all of the hard work put into. Uh, the operation of, of chariots and allowing us to be able to execute on the great customer service that we commit to. So thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>